Good morning and welcome to another in our continuing series of South Central Foundation's Nuka Fireside Chats. Thank you so much for joining us today. I'm your moderator, Gil Prickett. I've worked at South Central Foundation for about 16 years and currently am the Senior Clinical Advisor for Learning and Development. In response to the COVID-19 pandemic, healthcare is rapidly changing, including here at South Central Foundation. In these chats, subject matter experts from SCF will share some lessons learned and then open it up to you for questions and comments. At the bottom of your screen is a Q&A button. Here, you'll be able to submit questions or anything else you want to share and I'll make sure to direct your questions to our presenters. After today's chat, we'll be sending you a quick survey. So please give us your feedback so we can improve the next chat. If you're having any technical difficulty today, please email us at scfnucaevent at scf.cc and we'll have someone reach out to you to help as we're able. Now, I'd like to turn it over to our panelists to let them introduce themselves. Our panelists today are April Kyle, SCF's Vice President of Behavioral Health, and Steve Tierney, SCF's Senior Medical Director for Quality Improvement. Hey, good morning. Uh, my name is April Kyle. Uh, I'll do a, a very brief introduction first. Um, I've been with SCF for 17 years. Um, makes me feel old when I say that. I think I've sort of grown up here. Um, I am Alaska Native at the Baskin. My family's from the village of Nanelchik on my father's side. And I grew up uh, here in town and also spending time uh, in Nanelchik. And you'll hear me speak about the NUCA system of care from the perspective of a leader, but also as a customer owner, as a mom, as a daughter, uh, receiving care in the system. And good morning, I'm Steve Tierney. I'm a family physician by training. I arrived in Alaska to the native health system in 1995. Uh, it was right out of residency for me and it was my first job and I just haven't left. Um, uh, my uh, role now though has evolved into the senior medical director for quality improvement because I was there with the team when we began to actually change to say we're going to go from the old system to the new system. So uh, I've been involved in some of the big moments where we decided to take a big paradigm shift and, and hopefully we'll discuss some of that today and what it means and how we approach new uh, threats or pressures or uh, things to adjust to. Thanks, Steve. So um, I think most folks who signed up for this webinar already know South Central Foundation and NUCA system of care at least a little bit. Um, and so um, we have a slide up now that shares a bit about sort of our mission, vision, um, the structure of our organization, our value set. And I'm not going to, we usually do a whole hour on this, and I'm not going to do that. Um, I do want to share with you that we are proud to be an Alaska Native owned healthcare system. So we are community owned and we believe in multidimensional wellness. So physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual wellness for people, families, and communities. And so that drives our service uh, delivery model. Um, and we'll talk a bit more about that, but just knowing a, a little bit about SCF creates some framing for the conversation today. So, um, you know, we thought about what were the principles, the, the foundation that helped us in our approach to responding to COVID-19. And um, this is a quick list. I'm not going to read this to you, but um, we're framed by our structure for leadership and how we lead, um, by our clinical operations, how they existed and how they needed to change. Uh, same for business operations and infrastructure, and then with a lot of focus on, uh, on workforce. So as we talk about our approach to um, transitioning our, our care to our current reality, you're going to hear those themes um, in the presentation that Steve and I uh, do. So um, just a few things about the NUCA system of care, and we're going to start with um, our response on the medical side. And so, Steve, I'll pass that over to you. So what we did way back in the day when I showed up in 1995 is we had an old way when things would not go well. 
you know, uh, we would say, okay, well, here is how it works for us as medical professionals to do the work that we're going to do. And we will explain this to the consumers that we serve. And we'll say, here's how often we're open. Here's the appointment times. Here's how we're going to work. Here's how you make an appointment. And then when it wouldn't go well, how we would manage this is we would, for instance, get a navigator because it was failing, you know, or we would get a scribe because it was failing to do something. Or we'd add, but we wouldn't change what we were doing. We would just add things on top of it. Well, in the sort of takeover by the community, we actually started to say, we need to think differently. And so I like to go back to that, you know, to say we still do this 25 years later. We uh, have a new problem that we, you know, have to focus on. And in this case, back in the day, it was how do we work more efficiently for the consumers that we serve? So what we did was we set up, instead of trying to fix it with more effective referral processes or intake processes or things like that. Why don't we fix it by putting people together where it makes sense to put them together? So what we did is we recognized that there was a lot of people that, you know, referred to each other all the time. Why would we have them in separate buildings with a separate intake process? And what we have now is an integrated environment uh, that puts the primary care providers, the midwives, the pharmacists, the behaviorists, uh, the case managers, um, and this, you know, in, in a specialized sort of environment where they all could essentially leverage each other in real time for the customers that they serve together instead of being professional silos. And I think, you know, that original thought process has informed when we have new problems to solve, installing electronic health records, uh, responding to a government shutdown, uh, or in this case, COVID-19. So what we're going to do is talk about how this sort of, I call it our default setting with how we approach work when pressured with a new thing to solve. Virtual integrated care teams, what happened to us is suddenly we had created this physical environment, which made a lot of sense. And it was super efficient when you're a primary care provider who needed to say, boy, we need to talk to somebody with behavioral health skills or a pharmacist with very technical pharmacy skills. And suddenly we were in this now we have to isolate or we have to work virtually. Well, what had happened as a result of these long-standing legacy relationships is we actually said, well, that's, that's not a problem. You know, why don't we just do what we've always done, just do so in a virtual world. We had had in place Microsoft Teams and Zoom licenses. So what we did was what I call our normal SCF adjustment to you know, pressure or a new situation is we just said, well, we haven't really used it in, in this way before, but it's installed. Why don't we just start using it? So we, what we did was turn this on, started to actually leverage technology that was already in place. But the other thing that we did was really interesting is rather than prescript, you must use Zoom because we have bought all these licenses. You must use DocsyMe. You must use Microsoft Teams. You must use this. We actually started to do what I call crowdsourcing to say what you must do is the most effective thing for whatever it is you're trying to do. And what happened to us is as we went on that journey of discovery, we said, actually, Microsoft Teams makes sense for professional to professional communication and inter-organizational uh, you know, uh, uh, relationships, but it may not make as much sense for the organization out to the customer. Um, so when would we want to use one video solution, when we would want to use another? And what we started to do is play with essentially all of them in real time. And there is, as I'm sure everyone's aware, there's dozens of them. But what we're, we started to do after this, I would say, very, very um, crowdsourcy first two weeks is we started to coalesce to say what makes sense for this care environment, for this work environment, for this customer connection. Are we talking to many people? Are we talking to one person? How do we do the scheduling? Who manages the invite? Who manages the waiting room for the virtual environment? And that's where we have coalesced around Teams more for in-house and Zoom more for you know, in-house to the c customer, but we manage the waiting rooms a little bit differently because of uh, the different care environments. Okay, perfect. Thanks, Steve. So um, I get to talk about behavioral health. 
that's very exciting for me. So uh, when we made the, the very, very quick transition from our uh, existing service delivery mo model to our new reality during COVID-19, um, our team coalesced around a single mantra, which was that behavioral health is critical that all services will continue, that every customer owner will be served, that every service uh, will be open. Um, and that, you know, at first we were unsure, how do you do residential care? How do you do outpatient care? What work do you continue in person? How do you serve people experiencing homelessness? Um, and, and as soon as we sort of got our arms around a philosophy, which is that behavioral health is critical, it will continue, um, it might happen differently, but we're going to make sure that nobody's dropped, that everybody we're serving continues to be served. And all of our front end access points, all of our same day walk in, you're in today um, parts of our system would continue so that we could continue to serve people who have new struggles and new challenges over time. As soon as we got our mind around that, it became actually very exciting. Um, we empowered um, people and teams in our um, behavioral service delivery to come up with solutions to best need, uh, meet the needs of the customer owner or family that they were working with. Um, and those solutions were varied um, all across our system. So um, most of our outpatient services transitioned to employees working from home, um, serving customer owners who are also in their home environment. Um, we had a variety of ways in which that service delivery happened. Um, very quickly, we moved to phone services. We then transitioned to add video. And um, one of our big lessons learned was that there isn't a sort of a corporate decision that can be made about the best way to deliver care. Um, the best decision we could make was to empower teams to figure out the right intervention, um, the right service delivery model for that family right now. So for f some families, um, video worked great. For other families, there may have been a technology barrier or a bandwidth barrier, um, or just people are uncomfortable looking at themselves on a screen. I'm uncomfortable seeing myself on this screen right now. And so that may be a barrier to being very comfortable in um, really sitting in and, and experiencing your behavioral health uh, care. And so um, I think one of our big lessons learned was being able to empower teams to be creative and, and to come up with um, solutions. So some of our lessons learned as we um, did that um, for me as a leader was um, to be very clear on the philosophy, um, but to really empower employees and customer owners to innovate. Um, we learned that we actually can deliver a lot of care virtually. And if you look at our encounters for outpatient services, they've actually increased during COVID-19, not decreased. And for behavioral health folks who may be watching, that shouldn't surprise you, right? There's a lot of uh, need in our family and communities right now for behavioral health care. Um, but some of that was for very practical reasons, like um, no-show rates going down uh, because barriers to accessing care are removed. So our biggest barriers in behavioral health are transportation and child care. And if you can deliver that service with a customer owner at their location, wherever they might be, um, then you remove some of those barriers. So that was an important um, lesson learned for us. Um, other things we learned are that um, Quick PDSAs work. So you know, if, if you know a bit about us, you know we are on uh, a journey as an organization to um, consider everyone in our workforce to be part of our improvement team and to be empowered to listen to customer owners and let customer owner voice drive how we change our system. And even though we believe in rapid cycle PDSAs, we get caught up in, let me get more input, let me check in with more stakeholders, let me consult a committee, and you end up kind of overthinking a PDSA. And during COVID, we found when someone has a good idea, we say, why don't you try that tomorrow and let us know the next day how it works. So very, very rapid cycle learning. Um, and I think that's been refreshing for us as an organization to learn. Um, other lessons learned are that kids really like technology. So in our congregate living settings and our residential programs, we uh, very much limited um, visitors. 
and, uh, and replaced in-person visits with iPad visits. And the kids just took off with these iPads. They um, had increased communication um, and relationship with their family and external um, supports compared to kind of requiring those people to make a visit into program with scheduled time, we could make sure that we um, just did that virtually. And I think that that's a part of our system that we will um, hopefully keep over time. Um, and then lastly, I just wanna comment that one of our important lessons learned about doing work virtually is to recognize that virtually isn't always the best solution. So in youth residential care, nothing replaces a hug from mom. And we've got to figure out how in our current environment to mitigate risk, but also ensure the wellness of kids and families. And sometimes that closeness is important. Um, I'll give you one other example. We have a, a program called Kiana Clubhouse. It's a day program for adults with persistent mental illness. It's located downtown by the shelters uh, with folks who have a high risk of homelessness. And um, because of the intensive services that we do, most of the people were served are housed, but their housing is usually congregate living where they weren't able to leave and enter treatment. They were in uh, pretty close lockdown in their facility. And as we worked with the directors of those programs, we found that there really was a need for our customer owners to spend time together. And we have a, a model in our system called learning circles where we create space for customer owners with shared experience to be together, to learn and grow from each other. And so, for that population, virtual learning circles weren't as successful. And we actually ended up creating in-person learning circles on the property of the assisted living facility, sort of in the grass. Can you picture the grass, the manicured area with chairs that are you know, 10 feet apart with four or five customer owners coming out, sitting separately, but still being able to engage with each other and with our program, supporting them in the best way possible. So may not be what you expected me to say about virtual delivery of care, but it's important to know when it isn't the best option. So I think that um, Steve and I have tried to give you a brief, informal picture of what we've done around virtual delivery, um, how we based that on the existing sort of values of our organization, um, our lessons learned. Um, but we also wanted to spend most of the time today just in dialogue as a chat. So I'll turn this over to Gil and uh, move to questions. Thank you, April. Thank you, Steve. We've had several questions come through thus far. And um, one of the first ones uh, um, is, and what were some of the challenges that we've experienced as a system in moving to more phone or audio or in some cases um, video visits? What are some of the challenges that, that, that have come up that maybe we didn't anticipate? It was, it was really interesting because the assumption was we should do video. And the reality was a lot of the people that we wanted to interact with uh, didn't want to show their face or their living room uh, to us based on, you know, what was happening, you know, at the moment. Uh, they actually preferred the phone. So what we did was something I say we, we kind of always do. We don't let committee structure, we don't let the billing cycle, we don't let the regulatory cycle be the default strategist for design and improvement. What we actually do is allow the workforce to say what you need to do is high quality uh, care with the customer as an equal partner and to say we will create infrastructure to support that. So what we did was in the front end, we built a audio visit, a video visit, and then the old school, essentially real time visit. And we said, you will use these as opportunities to interact and you will ask the customer how they would prefer. But what we did was made it so that it was easy to fluidly shift back between I'm going to decide I need to see you physically, I'm going to do a video with you, or if you don't want video, that's fine too, because we've built an infrastructure that allows that. Well, then we also had to think about in the redesign uh, you know, space is, well, there's also a lot of sort of ongoing care that is not COVID related, and we can't ignore the fact that that still needs to happen. So we split the building into a respiratory you know, floor and a 
uh, care as usual floor. So we didn't have to cross potentially risk contamination or exposure unnecessarily, but we had two separate entrants for the respiratory floor as opposed to the care as usual floor. But we went a little further. We said, well, there's certain things that are very important to continue to happen. Injections for periodic medications, uh, vaccinations, blood draws, or testing for COVID. What do we want to do? Do we want to bring you in the building? Do we want to risk you know, exposure and contamination? Or do we want to manage this another way? So what we set up what we called uh, sort of uh, alternative support clinics where we'd have fully PPE protected workforce in sort of a tent area where we could do a number of things. We could A, test you for COVID, which we would just do exclusively in these uh, sites. B, we could actually have drive-through pharmacy where we could actually virtually, you know, we, we could pick up your meds and not come into the building, or we could draw your blood, give a vaccination, you know, because those things were important not to lose track of, uh, particularly if you're taking your periodic Haldol or, or, or injection like that. We don't want to stop that, but we also don't want to risk unnecessarily the workforce or the uh, consumer base um, with exposure that was unwarranted. Um, but I think what we've learned from this is it's really interesting. Why would you ever stop doing drive-through pharmacy? Uh, why would you ever stop doing drive-through vaccinations? Uh, or you know, and then how would we think about moving forward? Because today it's summer in Alaska, but in February that's probably still a good thing to do. But we might have to have some environmental adjustments to that. So we're, we're in the process of thinking. Wow, some of these are keepers forever. Some we will adjust, but how do we move forward? So Gil, I'll add a couple of other challenges to delivering care virtually in addition to what uh, Steve just shared. Um, one is, and Steve, you touched on this, people, whether they feel comfortable with their picture on a video. And so as we deliver care through learning circles, one of the things we've struggled with is what does it look like if you have a learning circle with eight or 10 people and half the people have their video on and half of the people don't? And what is the level of sort of comfort and trust and feeling assured that you're there with a real person who is in sort of a social contract with you to keep what's said in that learning circle um, as part of care delivery between that group. And so we've delivered some learning circles that are video, meaning you turn on your video, and some um, service delivery that's by phone, meaning it's okay that you don't turn on your video. And as we move towards stages of reopening, we're looking at introducing some in-person learning circles, although they're not going to look like they they did before. They're going to have smaller numbers in larger rooms with um, less opportunity for customer owners to congregate, which is something we actually usually encourage and, and like to see in our system. And so we're starting to explore which customer owners really like this virtual platform and will continue with it for sure in the short run, but maybe even beyond that. And then when is it really essential that we're doing this in-person work? And it does sort of stem from people's uh, not just technology and bandwidth, but really comfort um, with being um, seen on a video. Um, the other thing I'll share for behavioral health is that a, a challenge for us in this new delivery platform was that we looked closed. So if you drive by our building, it appears that there's nobody in the parking lot, and therefore you'd think that behavioral health is shut, when actually behind the scenes, we're delivering more care than ever. So that was fine for the customer owners who are currently in services. So for services to continue, we could call you and say, hey, Steve, um, I know that you plan to come in next week. We're making a transition. What would you like to try? Phone, video, um, does the time still work? And we could make an individualized plan with Steve. But for folks who are reaching out to behavioral health for the first time and they see that empty parking lot, they might not know that we're still in business. And so this message that behavioral health is critical, that we're here, that you can reach out to us and that we're open has been a hard one to figure out how to message to community. And, and usually a lot of those referrals come from our primary care hub where folks are receiving sort of brief intervention model behavioral health and identifying need to be referred to specialty care. And as volumes decreased in that environment of primary care, it was hard to make sure that we were serving folks who needed specialty behavioral health. And I think we've come a long way um, kind of in the weeks and months at 
at figuring out how to sit in relationship with community and make sure that we know that we're open and that we're here. Great, thank you both. Um, kind of piggybacking on this theme of how do you, started to talk about how do you create buy-in for some of this and how do you make sure that people are aware of what's going on? There's a question about how do you build trust in relationships virtually? And connected to that is a, is this question about how do you create space in a, vir in a virtual format, whether it's a learning circle or something else that feels as safe as, a, as one might feel in person? Uh, what kind of changes need to be made to address that? The, the thing that was interesting for us is since we already had uh, a very long 20-year legacy of this relationship-based care that was highly integrated and sort of a, an expectation by the community to say, if I need to have behavioral health support, I won't leave, I'll just wait and they'll come in. Or pharmacy or, uh, you know, now I'm newly pregnant, I need to see someone for you know prenatal care and the midwife will merely join me so we we already had that fairly well in place and and now in retrospect you know that helped us a lot um because these were not new relationships as we moved to a, a virtual environment so i i guess we, we may be a little bit out of our depth to say if you didn't have that in place how would you approach that um what i would say is uh in every case, we have not let the revenue cycle be the uh, default architect of change because you can get stuck in that. You can say, well, we're not going to get paid for visits that are on the phone, so we won't do them. Well, what we said was what's the right thing to do and the most efficient thing to do. And that seems a little scary because before COVID, we did not get paid for phone visits, yet we probably did three times the volume of phone visits per week that we did in person visits of which we would get billed. And, and that made it easier for us. But now that we get paid for them, we, we, we like having the opportunity to do so, but we continue to design to say, what's the most efficacious thing for care? Now that's scary because your CFO is now going, oh my God, you're gonna do a lot of work and not be able to bill for it. What we learned is when you reduce overhead, it actually helps you more. So about 73% of your total net budget per year is overhead spend. It's managing the inefficiencies of transfer from one department to another department of an intake and all. As you remove those barriers, as you make it easy for the customer to navigate them, you actually save money. So while you bill out less, since you actually saved more, you end up being a more lean, more efficient company. So it seems like on the face of it, if you just looked at revenue, you know, doing phone all the time is a bad idea. Uh, and what we learned is it's actually an efficient idea that makes the other things easier when we have to do them. Uh, but it means we had to essentially say, we're not going to let the revenue cycle dictate how we design, how we move forward, how we interact with a customer. We're going to let the customer do that. Yeah, I, I think that, Gil, the word trust is an interesting one. And you know, you might have a tendency to think you build trust by being right and people being confident that you're right. And our approach is the exact opposite of that. Mm. It's to have spent decades in relationship with community to say, as health care experts, we, we don't know what's important to you as people, as families, and as communities. And what we're going to get good at is listening. And um, that, that's our core competency. It's sitting in relationship with community, creating space for community to have voice, listening to community, and then responding, innovating, changing, showing community how we responded and asking them, did we get it right? Is that still what you need? How did that feel? Is that how you want your auntie to receive care? And then redesigning as we go. So if you follow that way of thinking that trust isn't about being right, rather trust is about sitting in real space with others and them knowing that you're listening to them and you're redesigning based on their needs and you use that model as you transition into COVID, it means that we walked with and in partnership. We didn't tell or do. So one example of that is we had um, a lot more 
um, tribal leadership health council meetings. So in a lot of our communities where we deliver care, um, that tribal government sets up a health council that becomes the local governance of the health care delivery in their community. And those community leaders are looking at the news and saying, what are we going to do about this thing called COVID? And we are sitting in as a leader hours and hours and hours per week in meetings with community leaders saying, well, let's talk about the options. What do you want? What are you hearing from community? How can we be with you in that? And figuring out messaging and education and changing service delivery model and checking in and saying things like, usually we would fly a clinician into your community. Um, do you want people to be flying into your small community right now? Or are you choosing to restrict travel? And if you are, let's talk about service delivery. And how do we respond to a crisis in your community? And what does that look like in person or from a distance? How does our work become supportive of your natural community healers versus us coming in and delivering care? And knowing that we're not going to get that right, but we're going we're gonna to ask you, what do you want that to look like for your people? And then respond and know that we're going to have to learn as we go. And in my mind, that's what trust is. Trust is sitting in relationship with people, not being sure that you're correct. And that has to happen at a, at a macro level as leaders, but then also empowering teams in the system to do that same thing at a micro level with a family and saying, you know, um, we're starting this Zoom thing. We think it's, you know, it's better care to be able to see each other in person. We'd like to try it, but what do you think? And does that work for you? And, you know, we had parents say, I only have the one laptop and I'm trying to figure out how my kiddo can use that laptop for school, but I have my phone. Can we do it on my phone? Maybe it's easier just to call and us saying, well, what is better for your family? And I think it's really hard in healthcare as experts in our field to really shift our, our, our paradigm to say the expert really is the family and our job is to adjust our care model according to that. And that, that's how I think about trust. It's, it's interesting and, and, it, and it, it makes me think about this. Um, so, you know, you're an organization, you do a lot of work, you know, a lot of things happen and then there is the advent of social media. Does everything work perfect every single day? And the answer is, of course not. Do people have problems with what's going on? Yes, they do. But what Ms. April is talking about, this long habit of always engaging with the community, always making it most convenient for the customer, recognizing as an organization that's actually margin, operating margin positive, although it may make your total net revenue a little negative. But here's what it buys you. When things don't go well and somebody goes on a, how should we say, you know, uh, you know, uh, social media, you know, rant about, you know, how they feel about it, our biggest defenders actually are the consumer base. They're the ones, not the leadership, not the CEO, not the leadership, uh, you know, jumping in and saying, well, here's it. It's our customer base who actually say, you know what, every time I needed something, they would find a way to get it for me and they wouldn't make me fit into their model of if I wanted a refill for my medicine, I had to drive 40 miles, make an appointment, show up and talk to somebody. They said, it's really hard for me. It's winter. It's Alaska. It's not the best time to drive that distance. Can you help me? And we said, yeah, we'll mail them to you. Is that okay? And we'll do that interaction on the phone. So if you're willing to do that, if you're willing to join with people, what they end up doing is joining you back on the other side to say these are this is an organization that helps us we value its service and and yeah it's not perfect but you know they were there for me so we think we should be there for them thank you both um one of the questions that that came up uh, um i think in response to the the previous discussion was around the role of alaska native culture um in SEF's response to COVID-19. Um, April, you mentioned, you know, in the, there were, there was a lot of consultation with and partnering with our, our tribal partners, the tribal councils, et cetera. I know that, um, you know, the way that we historically as an organization have engaged with our community, the customer owners whom we serve, um, that's something that, that, that I think is very important. But I'm wondering, um, I think the question that, that comes from, from Sophie, who asked this, is are there things that we can say that are, that are 
specific to or are unique to the to Alaska Native culture or cultures of the communities we serve that have influenced the way that we as an organization have responded to COVID-19. So I'll share a, a couple of, of thoughts about that. I, I'm always stuck on the questions about kind of how our work is driven by Alaska Native culture because I, I get caught up in, well, how isn't it? You know, it's really hard to say, well, culture is that we, you know, fished last week. I mean, culture is really in, in everything that we do. It's about um, us thinking about our elders program and leaning on our um, elder advisors and our elder advisory council um, to guide us in our response to connecting with and supporting our elders through this. And um, we know that we can't have elders, you know, gather for uh, a dance or a potluck. Um, but what we can do is make sure that we're doing home visits and that our elder providers are doing phone calls and technology when elders, when elders enjoy that. Um, and thinking both about um, sort of how we deliver food and 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 care for and love on people, but also how we um, create enough connection so that we can identify if there's a red flag, if we've got somebody who's struggling, how we can take care of the sort of mental and emotional and spiritual wellness of that of that family and pull in other resources um, if needed. Um, I think in our uh, youth residential programs, we very quickly eliminated. Um, outings that were to places of um, places in the public. So anything, anything that you might do where there would be lots of people, you know, was quickly out. But actually, that was kind of fun because the kids did way more skiing and sledding and um, and uh, camping trips and uh, things that are kind of connected to um, our land and our physical environment. And I mean, that, that those are sort of the best outings anyway. And so replacing some of the other outings with more of uh, things that are tied to, to our place um, has been uh, very positive. Um, I think for SCF, um, the fact that uh, tribal leadership uh, creates uh, the voice that governs how we do our work. Um, I'm, I'm actually jumping off this to have a call with two tribes about addiction in their community and the work that we can do with those tribes to partner with people as they're on their journey when that journey includes um, addiction. So um, that kind of work, that kind of connection to tribal leadership drives every everything that we do. And it makes it hard for me to say, well, you know, we made sure that culture happened, you know, at three o'clock on Tuesday because we had a culture learning circle. I mean, we we do we we bead together, we um, we eat together, we um, we share story with each other, and those have all become um, not one-offs, but rather incorporated into um, how we deliver care and how we change our care delivery model over time. And, and you know, I, I mean. I'm struck by this, you know, you know, because people will will tell us they'll say, well, you're a native, you know, organization, you're a native hospital, you deliver care to a native community. The, the, uh, I'm not sure that's really fully accurate. We, we, I mean, not that it's not. We we certainly do, but what we do that's different is it's not about being native or non-native. It's about showing up. You know, what we don't do is we don't come up with a corporate strategy and then deploy it and then do feedback surveys and make it about, you know, a survey process. What we do is show up, you know, I mean, to go to a community or to talk to a community, but I don't think this is unique or only applicable to native communities. I mean, I grew up in Baltimore. If you go south of Pratt Street, that's a German community that used to work at Bethlehem Steel. If you go east of, uh, or uh, east of, uh, Lombard Street, that's Little Italy. It's an Italian community. But I will tell you, without naming it, a very famous hospital in Baltimore uh, has decided their version of integrated care is to surround you with a fully integrated care team after your admission to the hospital <laughs> because that's strictly controlled. Uh, we would never do that. We would say how we learn about you is not through a customer service survey, not through some sort of, you know, poll that we put online is to physically show up and say, we're in your community, we're in your safe space, tell about 
tell us about what that's like. Now, we do it in a, in a tribal environment, but I don't see where that wouldn't be any different in Detroit or in yeah, Chicago. I think that's a great point. I think when the more that I have traveled and worked with other healthcare systems and communities um, who are looking at the NUCA model and who we're partnering with, and the more I talk about this multidimensional wellness and learning through story and um, um, connecting with our elders and connecting with our youth and investing in our youth and kind of all of these things that that are for us our culture, they're really they're really human values and there are things that are very unique for our people and there's power in us owning our own system and um, doing the types of things that matter to us as people. But that concept, it isn't unique to Alaska Native people. In fact, it's quite it's quite transferable. Can I just give one just really cool example? So the um, Executive and Tribal Services Division is harvesting right now um, and they're, they're harvesting with distancing uh, birch bark and we're figuring out how to do our youth raise program virtually. And we've never done that before. And I don't think we think virtually is our favorite way to do it, but we don't wanna miss an opportunity in the lives of our youth. And so they're actually gonna be delivering this birch bark to the homes of youth so that a virtual birch bark basket making learning circle can happen with the kids. And I'm, I want to sign up, sign me up. I think that's really cool. I love birch bark baskets, but just, um, and, and to be honest, as a, as a leader, um, I didn't, I actually happened to find out that was happening. It's not because the leaders are thinking of that. It's because we've created the infrastructure we hire based on people um, having workforce competencies that are, um, you know, how we sit in relationship with each other, how we sit in relationship with customer owners, um, how we innovate, and um, how we grow ourselves professionally. And when you hire based on those things and you create um, a system that's designed for people to innovate, and then you and then you let go, you set the philosophy, but you let people kind of try and explore those types of examples like birch bark basket make, making, they blow you away because it's something we've never done before that takes sort of a, a, it just takes somebody saying, I don't know, will this work? Let's do it. And, and we'll find out if it'll work, but I definitely want to sign up for that one. Oh yeah, and if this had been, we'll just say for example, in a uh, East Baltimore downtown, you know, hospital that has a more hierarchical view, this would have had to go through a committee. It, we don't do that, you know. Exactly, we, yeah. We, we would just say, is this a good thing to do? You have a, a fairly steeped version of how we want to serve and engage the community, please proceed. But you don't have to wait for permission for three committees to sign off on this to start doing it. And what's really interesting is we will actually, you know, as more, how should we say, senior people, uh, I'm not going to say old, you know, <laughs> um, but uh, we'll go, wow, that's really cool. Um, th this happens all the time uh, where we're constantly surprised about, you're doing what? Tell me more. That's really interesting. Um, I had no idea. Great. Thank you, guys. Um, one of the questions that has come up and um, I think it, it relates to, you know, we've got a lot of employees, myself being one of them, who are working remotely right now. And how, uh, you know, we've had to not only this change in the way we do work has not just impacted our customer owners, it's impacted our employees. So how is SCF supporting staff um, during this transition to increase telehealth and just kind of a change to the way that we do things? So let me um, let me start with that, Steve, and then you can jump in. Oh, yeah. I, I just I, I think um, th that you know we have recognized that there's a careful balance in figuring out how to support wellness for employees and wellness for community, and we have sat in that tension each step of the way, um, and we have there are a variety of different experiences that people are having. People are coming to work and nervous about it. People are at home and um, trying to figure out how to juggle, working at home, having a crowded space with other family members, kids are at home, you're also the teacher, how do you do all those things? You have employees at home who wish they were on site, you have employees returning to on site who are nervous about that. There's just a, this really wide range of experiences that people are having and each person's kind of family and experience are, are different. You have folks who you know, live with an elder 
and are very nervous about being out in the world during the time of COVID and then going back to their home and caring for an elder. And um, so approach number one has been just to sit in our default, which is that our supervisors um, and our teams are tasked with sitting in relationship with each other. So we have, you know, something we call core concepts. Many of you have probably heard about that. It's, it's understanding how we build relationship and connection with each other through story. And, um, and the goal is to keep those relationships intact, but just doing them virtually. So making sure that teams have ways to be connecting with each other and that teams have ways and employees have ways to connect with their supervisor and just to say, how are you doing? Um, how is this playing out for you? And to be to be real. And if you've spent time in our NUCA system of care, I, I started here in human resources and the idea of human resources here is very different than somewhere else uh, where we're about thinking about our workforce as family and sitting in relationship with family for the long run. Um, the second thing I'll say is that um, we uh, leaned on our learning circle platform where we know that, you know, sometimes healthcare is best delivered by going to an expert and having a one on one visit in person or virtually. But there's a lot of times when we can actually grow toward wellness as people by learning from each other who have shared experience and um, and and that has been um, revolutionary for our, our healthcare system to to really realize the power of uh, sitting around a campfire together, right? And um, so we created um, learning circles that are for our workforce, and they're happening twice a day, every day, five days a week for months now, called Nuka Strong. And the idea is that the world around us is just it's just bizarre right now. It's super challenging in a hundred different ways. And, and, and yet we're all busy, we're all working, we're trying to do it. And, 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 and sometimes you need a place to just check in as a person and say, hi, I'm April. I would love to hear how you're doing. And I, I, I'd really like to talk about what I'm struggling with and to learn and grow with each other. So increasing the frequency of learning circles, having learning circles that are specifically targeting, you know, parents who are at home or first responders or just open to, to the workforce. Um, we've, one of the challenges we've had with supporting employees is that, you know, we, we think there are a lot of good messages and tools that we could um, deliver to employees, but right now we're all bombarded with messages. And so how do we figure out how not to feed that flow? Does anybody feel bombarded with messages? How do we figure out how to enter into the right types of communication? And, and we came up with the idea of having one daily COVID email to employees per day. And that has kind of all of the clinical information you need to know, the changes that are happening in the organization, um, what's happening in the primary care setting, for example, as you might work in another part of the NUCA system of care, and you need to know what's happening. Left hand needs to know what right hand's doing. Um, and every day, um, as leaders, we empower the different parts of the organization to feed into that daily email announcement. Um, and then that is um, coupled with messages that come from our CEO. So our strategy has been to communicate, 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 and, uh, and, and, and those emails are frequent. And so we have to remind people to please read them because there's a lot of them. But overall, I think it's better to over communicate rather than under communicate. And that's been our strategy. What's interesting is, is what we wanted to do is we recognize this. Um, you get in this sort of revenue centric model where you have waste in your organization and rather than address that waste, you pursue revenue to essentially compensate for that waste. So we recognize when you have people that are working with the organization that so get the mission and vision of the organization that they can come up with a birch bark making you know, virtual thing. I mean, these are a capital resource. These people are a capital resource. Losing them is super expensive because it's really costly to advertise, vet, interview, orient, and then fully steep somebody in the Nuka philosophy, you know, to work in a fully integrated environment the way we have. So th these, these are far more valuable than buildings and cars than, than anything. Losing them is paramount to losing revenue. 
waste is paramount to losing revenue. So how can we reduce waste and retain people? And it means that we need to adjust to say, you're valuable, we want you to stay. We will find a way forward to keep you safe, but to protect you, to not make you suddenly job hunt, because it's easier for us for you to get your money from unemployment than it is for us to retain you and then adjust to the reality as it is. Uh, because if we have to take a hit for a little while, well, then we take a hit for a little while. But then our ability to come out and emerge from that stronger than ever with a fully retained staff who is now uh, who, who has got a clear message that the organization is here for you and wants to help you. Uh, now that actually has additive effect over years of doing that again and again and again. So I, I can't understate how important that is. You got to look at these or human beings are, are, are a resource, protect them. Thank you. We've got time for a couple more questions and I'm going to try to, try to um, combine some questions here in the interest of, of getting as many folks uh, the information they were asking for as possible. One of the questions that came up a couple of times was, uh, what changes, if any, have been made to the way that remote care is delivered? So um, folks may or may not be aware, but, but in addition to all of the customer owners that we provide care to here in Anchorage and the surrounding areas, we have a large number of customer owners who live in remote villages and remote sites around the state that we provide care to. And how has that changed uh, during the current COVID-19 response? Well, what we did years ago with the uh, village care is uh, we actually said, should we bring you to the experts or should we have the expert move to you? Um, so years ago, we recognized in Alaska the distances that we have to deal with and the waste that we create by flying you in from an island 400 miles off the coast of Alaska to announce to you that your blood pressure is elevated, give you lisinopril, and then send you back to that island was a ridiculous waste of everyone's time and super inefficient. So what we did many years ago was we said, why don't we hire somebody in your community, invest in them since they already live there, and then now connect them to a supervising provider, be they behavioral health, dental, or medical. And we have actually all three uh, where we will leave you in place. Well, what that means is now in a world of, you know, informed by COVID is it means that your movements uh, doesn't necessarily, your, your lack of ability to freely move as you would in the past doesn't necessarily negatively affect your ability to get access to information about how your health changes. You can remain in your community because we've sort of built that infrastructure. Um, but what we also had to do is to think, well, we used to sometimes fly you in if we wanted to do a more extensive, you know, uh, intervention. For instance, colonoscopy. We're not going to do colonoscopy in a small village of 200 people on an island in the Aleutian chain. We're just not going to do an elective thing during a time like this uh, because we would normally fly you in to do that. Um, so what we did have to do is accept that we're going to postpone some stuff. Uh, so we're keeping a very careful eye on things that we need to catch up on uh, that we are unable to do in a village setting to connect. But we're also uh, got enough of an infrastructure in place to say, but we will keep the wheels on things like refilling your meds, drawing your labs, because your blood can be drawn in this small village and sent in for review by the supervising provider rather than have you move, your blood sample can just move. So um, I, I think what we've tried to do is find opportunity where it exists, but don't pursue it where it adds more risk than it adds value. Mm -hmm. And the, the other thing I'll share is that, um, so the, the distance delivery has increased, right, to the villages. We've, we've continued to have some kind of medical professional travel in when, when it's really needed. Um, but it's really been based on the direction that's given to us by the tribal leadership around, you know, what kind of travel they want into their community. And, um, you know, w one thing I'll say is like for behavioral health, uh, most of our communities will have a clinician on the ground in their community two weeks a month. Um, and when that clinician is there, they can check in with the school. 
they can check in with the tribe, they can check in with the clinic and get a sense for sort of what's happening in the community. And then, you know, sort of figure out who they want to have coffee with or have tea with and, and check in on um, and deliver care with. And when we're not traveling there in person to actually have our own eyes on the ground, we're relying much more on the relationship we have with um, natural community leaders and, and asking them. So setting up Zoom, setting up phone calls to say, gosh, we can't deliver behavioral health the way we did before. Um, how's it going in your community? What, what's working? What's not working? Um, how can we support you as you lead wellness in your own area? And really um, acknowledging the local community leadership as being sort of first on uh, to deliver care in their community and our role being to listen to that community leadership and um, offer ways and co-create ways um, that we can be supportive of what their needs are. Thank you. One final question, and this is a, again, another kind of combo question here. Um, have there been any noticeable changes in the types of things people might be reaching out for behavioral health support for during this time? For instance, an increase in, in anxiety um, or panic disorders during this time. And uh, related to the kinds of services people are asking for and needing at this time, um, how um, have we as an organization addressed things like uh, providing medication-assisted treatment uh, remotely or virtually? So the first question, the answer is yes. Mm -hmm. uh, we've certainly seen an increase, um, an increased, increased challenges happening in people's lives that play out in a variety of different ways. And um, I think our response to that is to make sure that our healthcare system is listening and available right now. And you've heard us, if you've been to the Nuka Talks before, talk about you know, how you envision population-sized care and access and making sure that we don't break that when we transition to a new uh, COVID informed service delivery model. So making sure that people can still kind of reach out um, and trying to keep the way they do that as natural as it was before. So um, I'm gonna give a primary care example, even though it's Steve's world, so he can jump in if I say it incorrectly. We have primary care teams who are rotating, working in clinic, working from home, working on site together, but not in clinic. And we don't want our customer owners to have to navigate that, to figure out which week, who is where, and who am I going to see, and what's that going to look like. We want the care delivery, as always, to be grounded in the relationship that we've invested in um, longitudinally over time. And so the answer to my family about, gosh, I'm struggling, what do I do, is you just call your primary care team. That's it. It's the same number as before. You reach out to them. It doesn't matter where they are they're gonna call you back and figure out kind of what you need and how to connect you to the right person on that integrated care team or the right place in our system. Similarly, at the front end of our behavioral health service, we have a same day walk-in process. That's now a same day telephonic process. Same thing for the front end of our outpatient intensive intensive outpatient addiction treatment program where we have a same day, usually same day walk-in process and that's converted to a same day phone call back from a clinician process. So um, I think the, the goal has been to acknowledge that there's going to be a lot of need, but keep the way that you connect because of that need as consistent as it was before so that you're not asking community to adjust to our new reality of delivering care. And, and, and that's really interesting. It, I continue to do visits. I still do visits. I've got one scheduled later today. Um, you know, uh, but uh, so I'm still a practicing family physician. Um, I just had my schedule booked, but it would annotate on the schedule. This is video. This is phone only, you know, um, et cetera. So, so what we would, we would say is you will still call. You will still have things we need to talk about. We're not going to stop doing that. The way we do that, we will modify in this, you know, sort of adjustment. But um, I still have a schedule in Cerner, and I still do visits today. Gail, was there a second part to your question, or did we get it? I think that I think was it. It was, okay, yeah, good. you got it. Good. 
So unfortunately, we are out of time. I want to, in closing, I want to thank our panelists. I want to thank um, April and Steve for, for leading today's fireside chat. Um, I'd like to thank our participants for joining and for asking lots of really great questions. Um, unfortunately, we weren't able to answer all questions, but we answered most of them. Uh, I encourage you, if you were not able to have your uh, uh, question answered today, make sure that when you uh, receive your survey, uh, there'll be a space for you to, to, um, to ask additional questions. Make sure you ask your questions there. We want to make sure we try to respond and close the loop with you on those as we're able. Um, one other opportunity to, to ask additional questions is later today. April and Steve will be joining us again for another live fireside chat at 3 p.m. Alaska Standard Time. You can sign up for that again today uh, by going to scfnuka.com or share that link with your colleagues um, and others who you think are would be interested in finding out more about uh, the NUCA system of care and South Center Foundation's response to COVID-19. Please, please let us know if you have any additional questions and give us your feedback on the survey that you'll be receiving shortly. Again, thank you so much for all who participated today, both our panelists and our participants. We're excited to be able to share all of this information with you, and we look forward to talking to you again real soon. Thank you so much. Have a good day.